Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the past few videos, we've actually been doing a lot with cholesterol transport and just generally lipid transport. So we talked about all the lipoproteins, which range from chylomicrons to VLDLs and LDLs and HDLs. And we talked a lot about the physiology and the composition of all of those lipoproteins. In this video, I want to cover some topics that you wouldn't really need to know for any anatomy and physiology course. This is really just a for your information, for your fun. I find it very interesting, so I hope you do as well. What we're going to do is talk about a brief history of lipids. That's what I'm calling this. So we're going to do this over the course of a few videos. And we're going to dispel a lot of misconceptions there are about lipids. Okay. Now, I can't speak for the rest of the, the world, but I can tell you in the United States, lipids have a bad reputation. Um, especially if you go back 10, 15 years ago, if you went into a grocery store, there were a ton of products you'd see that were low fat. Um, I know for a fact if you went and looked at um, potato chips, uh, Lay's is a good brand, an example of that, you would see it would be low fat and you'd look at the ingredients and there was like a fat substitute called Olestra. And if your country, wherever you reside in, if it's um, predominantly low fat or if it's predominantly low sugar, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious to hear about that um, from you guys. However, the whole point here is in the United States especially, lipids had a bad reputation. And this actually stems from before 1984. This is actually a, an official Time magazine that came out and it was basically saying cholesterol is bad. So you see here we've got eggs, got bacon. Um, of course, those contain other things, but one of the major uh, nutrients that we find in both of those food products are going to be cholesterol and saturated fat. And before this date, in 1984, there was a study, a very poorly designed study, that has since been uh, disproven that pinned things like cardi coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease, among a whole host of other what we might term Western diseases, on saturated fat and cholesterol. In other words, these were pinned as the culprits in producing these diseases. Now, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but it suffices to say that this study had a lot of issues. It had a flawed study design, among other problems, such as the fact that it had a very low sample size. But for whatever reason, people ate it up, no pun intended, and so the AHA, or the American Heart Association, basically switched to recommending that you don't eat a lot of fat low fat recommendations. So either avoid foods that have fat or basically consume foods that have a fat substitute. I already mentioned that a lot of potato chips in the past, I don't know if they still do because I don't eat them, but they contained a fat substitute called Alestra. So whether it was a fat substitute or just not eating it, that was the AHA's recommendation. Now, before we get into the problems with that, of course, the sugar industry would be rejoicing at this. Um, the problem is, is that according to evidence in longitudinal studies, this is not a good thing. Okay? So when you switch to a low-fat diet, there's a couple things that happen. Okay? Obviously, fat consumption decreased. Okay? That's number two here, but um, that's the obvious thing. I mean, if you're consuming a low-fat diet, your fat consumption should decrease, right? Um, what ended up happening by default is the sugar intake ended up increasing because when you're making food products, Fat is one of those things that actually gives a very good taste. As human beings, we like the taste of fat. It's a very favorable taste. So if you want to keep the taste up, you have to put all sorts of other stuff in the food to keep the taste good so people will keep buying it. I mean, that's the principle of supply and demand right there. So you have to put more sugar in the food, um, and you also have to put a lot of fat substitutes in some of them to keep the taste up, keep it tasting good so people will buy it. Okay? So sugar in intake increased. Right Now, what we saw over the course of time, since the AHA made these recommendations and people started adopting them, is that the average body weight increased for both men and women, and I don't mean muscle mass. Okay? Basically, people were getting more and more overweight. And actually, what we saw is two major things. First of all, once we switch to a low-fat diet overall, we see an increase in obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So if you're not familiar with type 2 diabetes, it's the form of diabetes that is not genetic. Okay? Type 1 is the genetic kind. We're not concerned about that here. Type 2 diabetes is generally caused by sedentary lifestyle, but especially elevated sugar intake. 
Okay, so we actually see a rise in both of those. And then also we see a rise in cardiovascular disease and coronary artery disease once we adopt a low fat diet. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because if fat, particularly cholesterol and saturated fat were the cause of all these problems, then why is it that they're increasing? Now, if you were somebody that wanted to adopt these AAH new standards of low fat recommendations based on the study, this stuff right here, particularly three, four, and five, are a nail in the coffin, especially four and five on that argument. Because if saturated fat and cholesterol are so heinous, if they're so bad, then why is it that we see a rise in obesity and related to comorbidities, and then also cardiovascular diseases? We shouldn't see that if these are so bad. So basically, the government made a big oopsie, and the problem with that is, is that Science advances, but medical care doesn't. So if you actually go to the doctor's office here in the United States, most physicians will actually still prescribe that you don't eat a lot of cholesterol. Now, I'm obviously not saying that you should go out and just get a big block of cholesterol and start eating that. Not that you could find that. Okay. Obviously, I'm not saying that, but most physicians to this day will still tell you to avoid things like bacon. Kind of relaxed on the eggs a little bit, but bacon, um, a lot of meats... Don't eat that stuff, right? Because it's high in fat. So medical care really hasn't advanced. In fact, if you still look at the AHA guidelines, they still recommend low fat, okay? But in fact, if we fast forward from 1984, when this first Time Magazine came out that kind of set the stage for what was to come with cholesterol supposedly being bad, if we jump forward to 1999, they sort of printed a retraction, so to speak. So you got cholesterol, the good news here. Now, notice in this, they still haven't put the bacon back on here, but they did put the eggs back. And in fact, it is a well-known fact that eggs actually lower your, quote, bad cholesterol, which is LDL, and they elevate your HDL. So science is making progress here. If we then fast forward very far into the future, so 2014, which of course now is the past, they have this new Time magazine that literally says, eat butter. Butter is pretty much just solid fat. Um, scientists labeled fat the enemy why they were wrong. Okay? So clearly science is advancing and we're seeing that lipids are not something to really be afraid of. Okay? They're actually very good for you. In fact, your body, particularly your liver, actually makes about 80 to 90 percent of the cholesterol of your body. Okay? Only about 10 to 20 percent of cholesterol actually comes from the diet. The vast majority is made by your liver. It's made de novo through your own cells. Why would your body go through the effort of making 80 to 90 percent of your cholesterol total if it wasn't so darn important? Cholesterol is not the enemy. And what we're going to do here to conclude this video before we go into the others is I want to go over some of the major fates of cholesterol. And this is really just an exercise in negative feedback. It's a little bit of the science here. Um, and if you want some more information on this, I actually posted here uh, one of the sources where I actually got a lot of this information. Um, but again, it's well known, it's just not very well integrated into medicine. So cholesterol uh, biosynthesis, remember, cholesterol biosynthesis is accomplished by the liver. And it actually makes roughly roughly between 80 and 90 percent of your total body cholesterol. Um, that, that number will differ depending on what source you're looking at, but it's just a range, but it's the vast majority of the cholesterol. So what happens if, let's say, you intake a lot of cholesterol in the diet? So this could be from eating a nice ribeye steak, a wagyu steak, those are some good stuff, really expensive, but if you ever get the chance to eat that, you should. So really fatty steak. You get a lot of dietary cholesterol, so your cholesterol levels go up. So there's a few fates of cholesterol here. Um, first of all, your liver actually has something called um, a sulfotransferase. This is an enzyme that actually can attach sulfate groups to different molecules. This one is specifically the steroid sulfotransferase, and it just puts a sulfate group on cholesterol, making cholesterol sulfate. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, why is that important? Because cholesterol itself is hydrophobic. Okay? It's not very soluble, and you can't really transport it very well in the blood. However, if you sulfate cholesterol, meaning you attach a sulfate group to it and make cholesterol sulfate, you've dramatically increased the solubility of the molecule and that allows its excretion. And it can be excreted, yes, in the feces, but actually this cholesterol sulfate can be excreted in the urine. 
So the body, just by having steroid sulfotransferase, which is a hepatic enzyme in the liver, if you have excess cholesterol that your body doesn't need, it can just sulfate it and excrete it. So just eating more cholesterol is not going to make your cholesterol levels go up because if you just sulfate it, it becomes soluble and it just gets excreted. It's pretty, pretty neat. I will mention this, that the cholesterol sulfate also plays other functions in the body. In fact, we're starting to see that cholesterol sulfate can actually function as a hormone. It can travel in the blood because now it's been dramatically solubilized, so it can go to other tissues and exert functions there. Very interesting. We're just starting to see some of these functions of cholesterol sulfate and see that it's actually not just a metabolite, but it also is an important signaling molecule. Now, if you have high levels of cholesterol, they're going to be oxidized by oxidases. Now this process, I don't know it's, if it's very well understood, but it is known that there are oxidase enzymes that can just hydroxylate cholesterol, and they make metabolites called oxysterols. Okay? Now why is that important? Well, if you have elevated cholesterol in your liver, that is from the diet, then you're going to have more oxysterols. These oxysterols are important because they act in a negative feedback manner to inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis. Now, I'm not going to go into that here or that regulation um, because it's an entire video all to itself, but we will do that eventually. But it suffices to say that if you're looking to synthesize cholesterol, that is the liver is going to make it from scratch, there's an initial step, a committed step in the pathway that's catalyzed by an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And it turns out that this enzyme is incredibly regulated, very strongly regulated. So if you have a high amount of this enzyme, you're going to make a high amount of cholesterol. But we already have plenty of dietary cholesterol. We don't want to make any more. So these oxysterols actually can inhibit the, the function of HMG-CoA reductase. In other words, if we have plenty of oxysterols around, then we're going to have low activity of this enzyme. Okay? That's cool because if we happen to intake a lot of cholesterol from the diet, that tells the body we don't need to make as much from biosynthesis. We can slow that down. So if you have a lot of dietary cholesterol, you get a lot more oxysterols and inhibition of the cholesterol synthesis pathway. Very cool. And that's negative feedback right there, all the way back to your anatomy and physiology. Now this is the case when you have elevated cholesterol from the diet. Now let's talk about the case where you have low dietary cholesterol. Now this could be due to a number of cases. Um, you could have low cholesterol just transiently, let's say, due to fasting. Okay? But also people who follow a vegetarian or vegan diet are going to have very low cholesterol. In fact, a true vegan diet would have no cholesterol intake because vegan diets are devoid of animal products. And cholesterol is only found in animal products. So um, vegetarians might have some because of a cheese and egg. So if we have low dietary cholesterol, uh, that might indicate that we want to hold on to some of it. Okay? We don't want to excrete as much of it. So yes, you'll still have some sulfotransferase activity, but if you have low dietary cholesterol in the liver, you'll have a low amount of cholesterol sulfate. Right? That makes sense. And then if there's low cholesterol sulfate, you'll have a low level of excretion. That makes sense because if we have low dietary cholesterol, we don't want to get rid of it. Okay? We don't want to excrete as much of it. Okay? But here's the big thing down here. This is what I really want to emphasize if you have low dietary cholesterol. You're going to have a low amount of oxysterols, right? Because the amount of oxysterols, as we saw up here, is proportional to the amount of dietary cholesterol. So if there's more cholesterol, there's more oxysterols. If there's less cholesterol, there's less oxysterols. Now, remember what these oxysterols do. When they build up, they inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis by inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase. So if your oxysterols are low, then that's going to trigger a high amount of cholesterol biosynthesis and an elevated activity of this committed step, which is catalyzed by HMG-CoA reductase. So this, in both sides of the coin, are going to act as negative feedback on cholesterol biosynthesis. If we're eating a lot of cholesterol from the diet, then we don't need to make as much through the biosynthetic pathway. Conversely, if we're not getting very much of the diet, then we're going to need to make more through biosynthesis, so we're going to upregulate this enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. Now, this is just one way cholesterol is regulated, but 
Cholesterol biosynthesis and its levels are very, very tightly regulated. And the bottom line here is that the level of cholesterol that you have in your body is among the most tightly regulated systems in human physiology. Think about all that cholesterol is used for. It's used in cell membranes. That's very important. All animals have cholesterol in their cell membranes, and even some other types of organisms have derivatives of cholesterol in their membranes, like fungi. They have a derivative of cholesterol. Cholesterol is used to synthesize steroids. Important hormones like estradiol, progesterone, cortisol, testosterone, aldosterone, they're all made from cholesterol. And then also bile salts, which are used in the emulsification of fats in the diet. So regulating the amount of cholesterol is extremely important. And so just simply eating a lot of cholesterol in the diet is not going to allow your arteries to clog, as we would say. There's actually another mechanism at play there, and it has actually very little to do with cholesterol. Okay? And we're actually going to talk about that a little bit in the next video. So I'm going to leave with this. Dietary cholesterol alone will not clog your arteries. So what does? How does that work? And I'll give you a little bit of hint here with this picture, and we're going to pick up here in the next video. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.